Hello everyone. So for today's report, our group will be focusing on the phylum Apicomplexa, specifically two genera, namely the Plasmodium and the Toxoplasma. As you can see here, these are just some of the species that can be found in this phylum. From left to right, they are Babesia, Cryptosporidium, Plasmodium, and Toxoplasma, with the last two being delved deeper later in the presentation. Now, the phylum Apicomplexa has a few key descriptions. Firstly, they are unicellular in their forms, and also reproduce through the release of their spores. As for their parasitism, they are classified as obligate endoparasites, meaning they are unable to have a complete life cycle without being able to find a host, and they live inside said host. Lastly, Apicomplexa receive their name through the special structure called the apical complex, which are different organelles that are essential for the invasion of the host cell in its life cycle. In the figure to the right is a representative species of Apicomplexa and the close-up view of the apical complex. They consist of a conoid or the spiral microtubules, ropti or the secretory body, and one or more polar rings. Here, we will discuss the genus Plasmodium. To start, here is the phylogenetic tree of the genus Plasmodium. The figure presented was too big and thus it was cut to show some of the species of Plasmodium. I want to emphasize that studies that are recently being published show that despite some Plasmodium species being the same morphologically and or having the same host, they are distantly related to one another rather than closely related. The Plasmodium life cycle involves two hosts. First is an invertebrate host, or the blood-fading mosquitoes, which is now the definitive host, functions as a vector for disease transmission between vertebrate hosts and in which sexual reproduction occurs. Second is a vertebrate host, which is commonly regarded as the intermediate host, in which parasites reproduce asexually, begin sexual development, and cause the disease malaria. So plasmodium vertebrate hosts include reptiles, birds, rodents, and primates as seen in the table. So for human, we have plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium vivax, and plasmodium nolesi. For non-human primate, we have plasmodium cynomolgi, plasmodium nolesi. And for our rodent, we have plasmodium bergi, plasmodium chagodi, plasmodium ueli. And for our avian, we have Plasmodium mashfordi and Plasmodium gallinaceum. Lastly, for our insect, we have all the Plasmodium species. And now let's proceed with the vector. So the Plasmodium species, which are the causative agents of malaria, are transmitted by mosquitoes of the Anaphilis genus. So John Wilhelm Megan, a German entomologist, Known for his groundbreaking Riptera investigations, first described Anopheles as a mosquito genus in 1818. Anopheles is without a doubt the most studied and well-known mosquito genus, mainly for its great impact on human health. More than 500 species of Anopheles mosquito have been identified, with roughly 30 to 40 of these species being potential malaria vectors. So now, let's dive into some of the particular species that causes malaria and its vectors. We have here first the Plasmodium falciparum, which is a protozoan parasite that causes malaria in humans. This species malaria, also known as malignant or falciparum malaria, is the most deadly type of malaria, with the highest incidence of complications and mortality. It is much more prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa than in many other regions of the world. So, its known vectors are Anopheles gambiae, which is its principal vector, Anopheles albimanus, Anopheles freeborni, Anopheles maculatus, and Anopheles stephensi. Aside from that, we have Plasmodium nolesi, which is originally known to cause simian malaria, and human nolesi infections have been reported 
in nearly all the countries in Southeast Asia. So, Nolesi or Plasmodium nolesi vectors are Anopheles balabasensis, Anopheles crassans, Anopheles dyus, Anopheles hakeri, Anopheles latens, and Anopheles introlatus. Next, we have Plasmodium vivax, which is a protozoan parasite and a human pathogen. Recurring or benign tertian malaria is caused by this parasite, which is the most common and widely spread. Although Plasmodium vivax malaria is less virulent than Plasmodium falciparum, it can cause severe disease and death due to splenomegaly or a pathologically enlarged spleen. It was found mainly in the United States, Latin America, and in some parts of Africa. Its known vectors are Anopheles pseudopunctipenis and Anopheles albimanus. Then next, we have Plasmodium malariae. So, Plasmodium malariae is a parasitic protozoa that causes malaria in humans. While it is present worldwide, it is a type of benign malaria that is not nearly as dangerous as Plasmodium falciparum or Plasmodium vivax. So, its vectors are Anopheles aconitus, Anopheles anulipis, Anopheles arabianisis, Anopheles aztecus, Anopheles cosifasis, and Anopheles darlingi. Plasmodium ovale is a species of parasitic protozoa that causes tertian malaria in humans. In comparison to Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, it is extremely rare and far less deadly than the two. It is being um, limited to West Africa, the Philippines, Eastern Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. So, its known vectors are Anopheles albimanus, Anopheles atroparvus, Anopheles tyrus, Anopheles farauti, Anopheles pervorni, Anopheles gambiae, Anopheles maculatus, Anopheles quadrimaculatus, Anopheles defensi, and Anopheles subpictus. Many other different species involved are Plasmodium dominicum, Plasmodium agamae, Plasmodium regae, Plasmodium relictum, Plasmodium gallinaceum, and Plasmodium cynomolgi. Malaria is the main disease caused by Plasmodium species. Its natural history involves the cyclical infection of humans and the female Anopheles mosquitoes. The diagnosis of the disease depends to some extent on the clinical manifestations of the disease, but the most important is the demonstration of the parasites in stained smears of peripheral blood. In order to determine the presence of the said species, a blood specimen collected from the patient is spread as a thick or thin blood smear. The blood smear is then stained with a Ramanovsky stain, most often Gemsa. In the absence of the Gemsa stain, the right stain is used. The blood is then examined with an oil immersion objective. Visual criteria are used to detect malaria parasites and to differentiate the various species. The blood stage parasites of human plasmodium species exhibit differences in their morphology and modify the host erythrocyte differently. These differences can be used to distinguish the four species. For plasmodium falciparum, the distinguishing characteristic of the species are their crescent-shaped gametocytes. For plasmodium vivax, their amoeboid trophozoites. For plasmodium malariae, the reset formation of their merozoites. For plasmodium ovale, their compact trophozoite. And for plasmodium nolesi, the appearance of their segmented merozoites. Malaria is characterized by the overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines of the innate immune system. The most frequent symptoms include fever and chills, which can be accompanied by headache, myalgias, arthralgias, weakness, vomiting, and diarrhea. Other clinical features include splenomegaly, anemia, thrombocytopenia, hypoglycemia, pulmonary or renal dysfunction, and neurologic changes. As for pathogenesis, the major clinical manifestations of malaria include, first, the host inflammatory response, which produces the characteristic chills and fever, as well as other related phenomena, and second, anemia, which arises from the enormous destruction of red blood cells. The severity of the disease is related to the species. Infections caused by Plasmodium falciparum are most likely to progress to severe, potentially fatal forms with central nervous system involvement, acute renal failure, severe anemia, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Other species can also have severe manifestations. 
The characteristic paroxysm of fever in malaria closely followed the maturation of each generation of merozoites and the rupture of red blood cells that contained them. Prior symptoms of paroxysm include malaise, muscle pain, headache, loss of appetite, and slight fever. Or it can occur abruptly without any prior symptoms. Malarian forms are described based on the time intervals at which the onset of fever occurs. For tertian or quartan malaria, the entire paroxysm lasts for 8 to 12 hours and recurs every 72 hours. The patient is attacked with a feeling of intense cold, then rapid temperature rise to 104 degrees Fahrenheit to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. The victim shivers and experiences nausea and vomiting. Hot stage begins 30 minutes to an hour later with intense headache and feeling of intense heat. A mild delirium stage often lasts for several hours. Hot stage ends as copious perspiration drops back the body temperature to normal within 2 to 3 hours. For falciparum malaria, the onset of paroxysm is more gradual and the hot stage is extended. Each episode lasts 20 to 36 hours. The main causes of anemia include the destruction of both parasites and non-parasitized erythrocytes, inability of the body to recycle the iron-bound and hemozoin, and the inadequate erythropoietic response of the bone marrow. Other effects of anemia include the increase in blood bilirubin which causes jaundice, the deposit of hemozoin in the reticuloendothelial system, blackening or slitting of the viscera, impairment of macrophages, and hypoglycemia. Recrudescence pertains to the species remaining in blood for years, possibly for the lifetime of a host, without showing signs of disease and then suddenly initiate a clinical condition. Relapses and recrudescence are maybe due to lowered antibody titers or the increased ability of the parasite to deal with the antibody. They may also be caused by the genetic variation of the parasites to evade host immune defenses. The VAR genes of Plasmodium falciparum encode their antigens and the proteins that these genes encode are the ones incorporated into the erythrocyte membrane. As only one gene is expressed at a given time, the switching of the parasite to another VAR gene may be responsible for such recrudescence to occur. It also appears that relapse is mainly caused by the pre-erythrocytic merozoites reinfection of other hepatocytes with subsequent reinvasion of red blood cells as relapse occurs after erythrocytic forms were eliminated by erythrocytic schizontocytes such as quinine and chloroquine. However, not all species of plasmodium cause relapse. Among the parasites of primates, only P. vivax and P. ovale of humans and P. cynomolgi, P. fld, and P. semi ovale of simians cause true relapse. In species that undergo relapse, there are two populations of exoerythrocytic forms schizonts and hypnozoites or the sleeping animalcules. A patient may be asymptomatic for a while while having a high circulating parasitemia level. Such tolerance may be related to the loss of reactivity to tumor necrosis factor or TNF. Premonition refers to the resistance to superinfection while the host's immune response controls numbers of parasites remaining in its body. It is only effective as long as a residual population of parasites is present. Protective immunity has some components that are species, strain, and variant specific. Existing infection with P. vivax can provide some protection against infection with P. falciparum, or at least prevent severe symptoms. Immune effectors can also provide protective mechanisms. Binding of specific antibodies to surface proteins of sporozoites and merozoites, evidence of antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, or ADCC, cytotoxic T lymphocytes that kill infected liver cells and high levels of IgG response may play a role in reducing severity. Heritable anemias also exist, such as sickle cell anemia and Duffy blood groups. In persons homozygous for sickle cell anemia, a glutamic acid residue in the amino acid sequence of hemoglobin is replaced by a valine, interfering with the conformation of the hemoglobin and oxygen-carrying capacity of the erythrocytes. Individuals with sickle cell anemia usually die before the age of 30. In heterozygotes, some of the hemoglobin is normal and such people can live normal lives, but the presence of the abnormal hemoglobin confers 80% to 95% protection against severe malaria. The selective pressure of malaria in Africa has led to the maintenance of this mutation. 
West Africans and their descendants possessing Duffy blood groups are also much less susceptible to Vivax malaria than are people of European or Asian descent. The malaria parasite life cycle involves two hosts, the female Anopheles mosquito as the definitive host and humans as the intermediate host. During a blood meal, a malaria-infected female Anopheles mosquito inoculates sporozoites into the human host. The sporozoites infect liver cells, and once it infects liver cells, the species undergo exoerythrocytic schizogony. The sporozoites then mature into schizones, which rupture and release merozoites. Take note that for species in P. vivax and P. ovale, a dormant stage, hypnozoites, or small animalcules that are sleeping, can persist in the liver and cause relapses by invading the bloodstream weeks or even years later. Merozoites infect red blood cells wherein the parasites undergo a sexual multiplication in the erythrocytes, which is referred to as erythrocytic schizogony. The ring stage rhophozoites mature into schizones, which eventually rupture and releases merozoites. Some parasites differentiate into sexual erythrocytic stages, producing gametocytes. These blood stage parasites are responsible for the clinical manifestations of the disease. The gametocytes are ingested by an anopheles mosquito during a blood meal. The parasites then undergo a sporogonic cycle, allowing the parasites to multiply in the mosquito. While in the mosquito's stomach, the microgametes penetrate the macrogametes, generating zygotes. The zygotes in turn develop into oocins, which invade the midgut wall of the mosquito, where they develop into oocysts. The oocysts grow, rupture, and release sporozoites, which make their way to the mosquito's salivary glands. Inoculation of the sporozoites into a new human host perpetuates the malaria life cycle. Malaria is a disease that occurs worldwide. There are about 200 million cases globally each year, with over half in sub-Saharan Africa. Globally, about 500,000 deaths occur each year, with 90% in sub-Saharan Africa. Infection is highest in areas with hot, humid climates and lower altitudes. Malaria is common in the area south of the Sahara Desert, which is also called as Sub-Saharan Africa. This is because the disease spreads almost entirely in poor regions with tropical and subtropical climates. The local weather allows for transmission to occur year-round. There are two types of malaria which are the uncomplicated and the severe malaria. The uncomplicated malaria is the classical malaria attack which lasts for 6 to 10 hours and it consists of a cold stage where in sensation of cold and shivering may occur and a hot stage where in a fever, headaches, vomiting, and seizures in young children may be observed. And lastly, a sweating stage where in sweats return to normal temperature and tiredness may be felt by the patient. These attacks occur every second day with the ter tertian parasites, which are the P. falciparum, P. vivax, and P. ovale, and every third day with the quartan parasite. Severe malaria or cerebral malaria occurs with abnormal behavior, impairment of consciousness, seizures, coma, or other neurologic abnormalities. Other manifestation also includes severe anemia, hemoglobinuria, acute respiratory distress syndrome, abnormalities in blood coagulation, low blood pressure caused by cardiovascular collapse, acute kidney injury, and hypertension. Hi Parasitemia. Metabolic acidiosis also occurs with association in hypoglycemia. For the control of the malaria disease, artemisinin in combination therapies or ACTS is used as a treatment for the infection caused by the P. falciparum. It is proven to be highly effective. However, Resistance detected in greater Mekong sub-region. As for its prevention, vector control, which includes indoor residual spraying or long-lasting insecticide-treated mosquito net or LLINS were need. Other prevention methods, which include preventive chemotherapies and vaccine, also used in order to control this disease. 
Let's now proceed to Toxoplasma, specifically Toxoplasma gondii, a parasite that infects thousands of people each year. To give a short history, Toxoplasma gondii was first discovered by scientists Charles Nicol and Louis Manso in 1908. The newly discovered species was named Toxoplasma because of its arc or bow-shaped body, and the epithet named gondii was derived from the hamster-like rodent species where it was discovered from, the Tenodactylus gundii. So what is Toxoplasma gondii specifically? Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan, obligate intracellular parasite that causes toxoplasmosis. The infection produces a wide range of clinical syndromes in humans, land and sea animals, and various bird species. Toxoplasma gondii has been recovered from various locations throughout the world, majority in the US, but except Antarctica. So as you can see in the phylogenetic tree, Toxoplasma is a member of the phylum Apicomplexa, class Sporozoea, order Eucoxidiorida, and family Sarcosistidae. Interestingly, there is only one recognized species under the genus Toxoplasma, and this is the Toxoplasma gondii. Various strains of this parasite have been discovered from different locations, but no new species have been discovered yet. So how does this parasite thrive? There is only one known definitive host for Toxoplasma gondii, and they are members of the Felidae family, the domestic cats and their relatives. Toxoplasma gondii are able to reproduce sexually in the stomachs of cats, and they are released into the environment through the cat's feces. While the intermediate hosts of this parasite are warm-blooded animals, mainly rodents, birds, and humans. In this case, the parasites are only able to reproduce asexually. We now proceed to the life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii. This image basically shows you the life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii, where, as being mentioned, the definitive host would be the cuts. And it also shows you the different modes of transmission of this parasite to infect humans. First, we have the unsporulated oocysts, which are being shed in the cat's fecal material. Oocysts are usually shed for one to three weeks. However, large numbers may be shed. And these oocysts take one to five days to sporulate in the environment and becomes infective. Next, uh, the intermediate hosts in nature, including these birds and rodents, become infected after ingesting soil, water, or plant material that is contaminated with oocysts. And these oocysts would transform now into tachyzoids shortly after the ingestion. These tachyzoids are rapidly multiplying forms and localized in neural and muscle tissue that is responsible for the initial infection and would develop into tissue cis bradyzoites. And these bradyzoites are shorter, slow growing forms that are seen in chronic infections. And lastly, the cats would become infected after consuming the intermediate host that harbors the tissue cis. And in addition, cats may also become infected directly by ingestion of these sporulated oocysts from the environment. And animals that are bred for human consumption and wild game may also become infected, such as these a pork or the pig, infected with tissue cysts after the ingestion of sporulated oocysts in the environment. In relation to the previous slide, there is no known or identified vector for Taxoplasma gondii, but there are different ways on how it can be transmitted. As stated earlier, any warm-blooded animal can be an intermediate host of the said parasite. One of the most common ways on how this parasite is transmitted to humans is through food consumption. Eating undercooked, contaminated meat, or accidentally ingesting undercooked and contaminated meat or shellfish after handling it and not washing hands thoroughly can be a cause, since toxoplasma cannot be absorbed through intact skin. Another way is through eating food that was previously contaminated by knives, utensils, cutting boards, or other foods that had contact with raw contaminated meat or shellfish. 
Another way of getting infected is through contact with cat feces, most especially to owners of infected cats. Cats are not natural carriers of this parasite, but they can get infected by ingesting infected intermediate hosts in the form of rodents and birds. And lastly, the only person-to-person -person transmission is through mother-to-child birth, a woman who is newly infected with toxoplasma during or just before pregnancy can pass the infection to her unborn child, and this is known as a congenital infection. Next, we go to the epidemiology. The disease caused by the protozoan parasite Toxoplasma gondii is known as toxoplasmosis, and it occurs worldwide. This figure shows the global status of Toxoplasma gondii prevalence having the American continents, the North America and South America, the Europe, and some parts of Asia with high prevalence. In these regions, it has been shown that more than 60% of some populations have been infected with Toxoplasma. In the United States, it is estimated that 11% of the population, 6 years and older, have been infected with Toxoplasma. And finally, the infection is often highest in areas of the world that have hot, humid climates and lower altitudes. It is because the oasis survive better in these types of environment. Toxoplasmosis infection varies in different individuals affected. In general, disease exhibit flu-like symptoms such as fever, muscle pain or aches or myalgia, sore throat, headache, and swollen lymph nodes, especially on the neck. For people with weakened immune system, severe complications are known to be exhibited, such as the cerebral toxoplasmosis, which causes headaches, seizures, and confusion. Another thing is pneumonitis, when the toxoplasmosis impacts the lungs, which can cause fever and cough. And lastly, ocular toxoplasmosis, which is an eye infection, and it may cause vision problems. Toxoplasmosis also affects babies. Symptoms include poor feeding, skin rashes, anemia, jaundice or the yellowing of the skin, and swollen lymph nodes. For children who got toxoplasmosis from birth or congenital, symptoms include hearing loss, optical problems and, with regard and it's with regards with the vision, and intellectual disability. Toxoplasmosis usually resolves on its own. However, for people who have weakened immune response, are usual, uh, they are usually prescripted with uh, medicines such as pyrimethamine, which is used to fight for parasites, and it includes also malaria, and sulfadiazine, which is an antibiotic. For pregnant women, spiromycin is administered before being given the combination of pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. Since pyrimethamine lowers the folic acid levels in our body, folinic acid will also be prescribed in order to lessen the side effect. But first, in order to prevent having to get the treatment and its costs, food safety is a must. Toxoplasmosis from the parasite Toxoplasma gondii can be found on raw meats or shellfish. As such, there should be no undercooked meats or shellfish. It is then recommended to cook these foods under ideal internal temperature for it to be safe for consumption. In a similar way, untreated water might contain a parasite and thus should not also be consumed. Basic hygiene should also be observed to prevent 
the toxoplasmosis by washing your hands frequently, especially when handling the raw or unprocessed meat. You can also wash the used utensils that handle raw meat. And also washing of hands after doing garden work as it might also be contaminated. Washing of vegetables or meat first before preparing or consuming is also recommended. For people with cats, uh, the cats should be uh, at the indoors as much as possible to prevent contamination. And also, the important one is to wash your hands properly after handling the cat litter or the litter box.